Okay, fantastic. Well, hello, good morning, welcome. Uh, I've just moved rooms. This is the joy of streaming live from your home uh, with not such great internet connection. So I've moved from my kitchen into my living room, which actually is making me feel much more relaxed. So I hope you're feeling relaxed wherever you are. And, uh, and if so, I think we're going to begin. I'll, I'll, actually, I'll welcome everyone who's um, on the Zoom at the moment. So we have Karen, who's going to be leading our prayers this morning. James is going to be um, reading our Bible verses. And Louis, who's going to be preaching. So welcome, everyone. And I'm Laura, Team Vicar. Great to be with you. So let's take a moment to pause and bring before God everything that uh, we've brought with us this morning. So we pray. Spirit of God, when paths of transformation lead me into times of wilderness, periods of learning and unlearning, realities winding and unruly, may your presence be my steady companion. If I feel afraid of the unfamiliar or the unknown, a stranger to where you are leading, remind me I do not go alone. All who seek your wisdom are wondering. When I forget, remind me that this is part of love's work. Help me to be patient with my journey, letting love set the pace. To you, I will turn for nourishment along the way, remembering the simple pleasures of being alive, of being together, of being among the creations of your hand. There is no stretch of the earth where delight cannot be found, or with the desire to further the common good. Lead me more deeply into the heart of love. In the company of your promises, faith shall be my guide. So I'm going to light my candle now. And if you have a candle, you're welcome to, to light that too. We see the light for our journey and believe that the spirit always moves ahead of us. As we feel the warmth of the flame, we remember the warmth of God's love wherever we are. So we're going to have our first uh, song this morning, and that's Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. Just bear with me one second as I get that up.
So our collect for today. Risen Christ, you filled your disciples with boldness and fresh hope. Strengthen us to proclaim your risen life and fill us with your peace to the glory of God the Father. Amen. I'm going to hand over now to James to read us our Bible passage. Thank you. Uh, this morning's reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 12, The Triumphal Entry. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the festival, on hearing that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. They began to cry out, Hosanna, blessed in the name of the Lord is the coming one, the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Thank you, James. So may I speak in the name of the living God. Amen. So here we are, the triumphant arrival at the final envelope in our journey through the Sundays of Lent. The crowd roaring us on to the big finish as we open to find a mini palm cross. Hmm. Well, it's cute. It fits nicely on my portable prayer area. Um, an old shoebox, basically. Um, as well as into the little envelope. Um, really conveniently into the little envelope, in fact. And obviously it's entirely appropriate for today as we celebrate Palm Sunday. The final Sunday in Lent and the beginning of Holy Week. But... If I'm honest, it also feels a little bit inevitable, maybe a little bit mundane. Uh, the least surprising, perhaps, of our interesting array of enveloped Lenten surprises. Perhaps it's even a bit underwhelming. Is this it? And maybe that's how some of the crowd felt that day, sometime around AD 33 peering through the mass of bodies, trying to get a glimpse of whatever or whoever it was at the centre of all the excitement, only to see a person on a donkey. Let the party begin. Well, whatever. You know, there was a big crowd doing something so that was probably reason enough to join in with whatever was going on, regardless of what it actually was. After all, crowds can be exciting, encouraging, joyous things to be a part of, creating a sense of belonging and togetherness. But they can also be frightening, unpredictable things, capable of violence and damage to things and people and to themselves. And of course, how you perceive a crowd depends very much on your perspective. If you're in a position of authority, for instance, a crowd can bolster that position or it can undermine it. And if you're looking to affect change, a crowd can be a means to achieving your aims or it can be an impediment. And although from the inside, a crowd can be a place of unity and mutual support, from the outside, it can appear alienating and threatening, especially if the crowd decides that you somehow represent something that deserves to be the focus of their opprobrium, that you are a target. In a book first published in the 1840s called 
Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, the Scottish writer Charles Mackay tried to understand what would later become termed crowd psychology. One of Mackay's observations was that, quote, we find that whole communities suddenly fix their minds upon one object and go mad in its pursuit. That millions of people become simultaneously impressed with one delusion and run after it, till their attention is caught by some new folly more captivating than the first." End quote. This is perhaps an apt description of the behaviour of the crowds in Jerusalem, who first welcomed Jesus as their Messiah, an object of praise, only to quickly turn, soon treating him as an object of scorn, derision and hatred. Indeed, Charles Mackay seems to conclude that, more often than not, crowds tend to get things wrong, and when faced with the truth, they compound things by becoming angry, often violent, allowing hate to rule, with destruction following, to the detriment of everyone. But Mackay also suggests that, sadly, this just seems to be a part of human nature. Again, I quote Mackay. He said, of all the offspring of time, error is the most ancient and is so old and familiar an acquaintance that truth, when discovered, comes upon most of us like an intruder and meets the intruder's welcome. In other words, we often don't like truth when it arrives and want to chase it away. Jesus comes as God's truth into the crowd that manifestation of human power. And when the crowd does not want to or cannot face the truth, it turns and tries to destroy it. And perhaps this can tell us something about the difference between human expressions of power and God's expression of power. Human power tends to be expressed through strength, force, domination, through having more of something than someone else be that resources, land, weapons, or people, sheer force of numbers. With the crowd in support, Jesus must have seemed very threatening to the authorities of Jerusalem, both Jewish and Roman. But without the crowd around him, Jesus was just a person on a donkey, riding into the city that day, like so many others. Of course, when the crowds turns against when the crowd turns against Jesus, Jesus hasn't even got a donkey anymore. He's a prisoner, friendless, naked, beaten, brutalized, and awaiting execution. And it is to the will of the crowd that Pontius Pilate gives the responsibility for this sentence, washing his hands in apparent democracy seemingly allowing the majority opinion to rule the day and absolving himself. There is a famous Latin saying, Vox Populi, Vox Dei, which translates, the voice of the people is the voice of God. It was quite famously used in 18th century England by parliamentary campaigners seeking to curb royal rule in favour of greater democracy articulating the principle that no particular person had any natural right to power. So people had the right to choose what form of government they wanted, whatever it was. Now, interestingly, the first recorded use of the phrase Vox Populi, Vox Dei in England was actually in a letter written by Alcuin of York, the famous cleric, scholar and theologian, to King Charlemagne in the 8th century, urging Charlemagne to resist democratic ideas because, quote, the riotousness of the crowd is always very close to madness, end quote. This was Alcuin's advice. The madness of crowds again. And perhaps the will of the crowd, majority rule, the power of the many is not always necessarily a good thing. 
After all, crowds can be manipulated, swayed by charismatic leaders or by conspiracy theories, motivated by fear and hatred. Perhaps the point is that human systems of power, the will of the crowd, like democracy, the force of the majority, are not necessarily good or bad. It just depends on how they are used. It depends on the societies that result from these systems of power. It depends how real people are actually affected, whether justice and the good of all are sought or not. The voice of the majority, the will of the crowd, does not always have the right or fair or just answer. And so ultimately, we can't really look to our systems of power to save us. We can't idolise things like democracy as the answer to all our problems, treating the will of the crowd as if it were something sacred. As recent political events in our own country and around the world have demonstrated, democracy can give us answers that we don't like and can even be used to suppress and destroy the apparent freedoms it seems to allow. Whilst crowds and their actions can embody both freedom of expression and the oppression of others. And maybe this is because democracy, the voice of the majority, the will of the crowd, is not necessarily the same thing as true freedom. It is after all, a fallible human thing, involving fallible human beings at all levels. And so it can't very well bear the weight of our expectations, hopes and dreams. And so it often, like all systems of human power, bears the brunt of our disappointment, our hate and our fear when it goes wrong. Like all idols, human power and the will of the crowd will always at some point let us down because it doesn't ultimately have the power to save us. Because we can't do any of this in our own strength, not even the strength of a crowd. But what about God's power? As well as opening envelopes during Lent, we've been reading through the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. And in chapter one of this letter, Paul has something to say about human conceptions of power compared to the power of God. Paul says, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. So when compared to the strength of the crowd, like that crowd in Jerusalem, God's power is vulnerability, weakness, in the second letter to the Corinthians, Paul relates Jesus' words to him. He says, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. And this is, I think, a difficult thing to understand, certainly from a human perspective, with a human understanding of power. But it is a truth that we are all being called into. A truth that cannot be destroyed by any crowd. A truth that turns human ideas of power on their head. A truth that will save. So, what does God's power look like? It doesn't look like a crowd. It looks like a person riding on a donkey. It looks like an underwhelming cross at the end of a journey, a pilgrimage, but it is an empty cross. In the name of the living God, Amen.
Thank you, Louis. And we're now going to move into a time of prayer. So I'm going to hand over to Karen now to lead us in prayers. Thank you, Laura. As a response to my bidding, Lord, hear us, is Lord, graciously hear us. Lord, hear us, Lord, graciously hear us. As Jesus entered Jerusalem, knowing that he rides toward rejection and death, suffering in order to give us life, as they crucify him, he prays, Father, forgive them. Oh, what a mystery, meekness and majesty. Let us bow down and worship, for this is our Lord. It was hard to love you and to love one another, to go on loving through insult and praise, through acceptance and rejection, in the sure knowledge that you are our Lord. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Lord, as we worship you today, save us from empty prayers or following the crowd. Save us from pride and save us from ourselves. Give us grace to courage and courage to follow you this holy week from death to resurrection from darkness to fullness of light. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for all who are struggling at this time due to illness, lack of employment, financial problems, loneliness, or loss of a loved one recently or at this time of year. We pray for Canon Neville Black and his daughters Mandy and Penny, for Blimp Parry, all the Faye family, Loretta Bartley, for all that we bring before you, any that we know or any that we don't know, but only you know, who particularly need your help. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We commend all who have recently parted this life. We pray for the souls of Wendy Black, Ellen Fay, Robert Parry, Florence Marsh, for all the victims of the COVID virus over the last 12 months, and for all others that we hold dear. Lord, you are a light which eternally shines. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. As we bring all our prayers together, we pray. Mercifully, Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Karen. So now we move to our prayer of preparation. And if you have anything to eat or drink with us this morning, you might want to get that out as we say these prayers together. God of our journey, as we walk with you on your path of obedience, sustain us on our way and lead us to your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we give you thanks, because each year you give us this joyful season when we prepare to celebrate the Paschal mystery with mind and heart renewed. You give us a loving, a spirit of loving reverence for you and of willing service to our neighbour. As we recall the saving acts that give new life in Christ, 
you bring the image of your son to perfection within our hearts. And so, We praise and bless you, loving God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you, gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we remember all that Jesus did. In him, we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross, bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. And we gather our prayers together in the words that Jesus taught us. Divine Mother, Divine Father, to be in you is to be in heaven. May we hear the wonder that echoes in your name. May we accept no rule but the rule of love. May we never tolerate the evil of hunger. May the hurts we cause be forgiven and the hurts we receive be healed. May we remember that we are fragile and cherish the life we share with all. For all love and life and power is the gift of the Spirit. Amen. So you're invited now to eat and drink whatever you have. And um, I'm going to just play another piece of music while we do that.
so our prayer after receiving. Lord God, your son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open our eyes of faith, open the eyes of our faith, that we may see him in all his redeeming work, who is alive and reigns now and forever. Amen. So before we come to our final blessing, i um, just got some notices because this week is, of course, Holy Week. Lots going on. Um, hopefully some of you will have received our e-news already. But if you haven't, it's on the Facebook page. So do have a look. I, I'll quickly try and run through the week from memory, which is a bit of a challenge, but hopefully I can do it. Um, so Monday night, we've got a poetry evening at 7.30 on Zoom. And uh, Tuesday night, we have Taste of God um, in the daytime. So that's 12.15. And then on Wednesday, there is um, one uh, leading Queer Stations of the Cross, which looks really interesting. And that's again Zoom in the evening. Uh, on Thursday, we have a Monday, Monday Thursday uh, meal that you are going to bring your own meal to, but a Zoom. So we're going to sort of share and eat together is the plan at 7.30, which Miranda's going to be hosting. And on Friday, um, there'll be a um, kind of a streamed video that'll be prepared in advance. Um, I think in the notices it said it'd be on Facebook, but actually it's probably gonna be um, on YouTube. But either way, I'll make sure it's on linked on Facebook. So you'll be able to catch that. And that's gonna be at one o'clock. And then, oh, there's more, isn't there? Saturday, how could I forget? The Vigil at St. Bride's at 9 p.m. Is that right, Louis? Yep, I'm looking, yep. So you can go in person to that if you would like to. Uh, and then on Sunday morning, we have 10 o'clock live on here as usual. We have um, 10 o'clock at St Dunstan's in person, which is very exciting. And another in-person service at St Michael's in the city with Louis. So, and I've missed something out. Go on, Louis. No, just to say that that's uh, the St. Michael service is at 11.15. 11 11.15, thank just, you. Just in case you're using public transport, it'll give you a bit more time to get into town. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're getting a bit of a lie-in if you're uh, part of the St. Michael's gang, don't you? <laughs> um, brilliant. Have I missed anything else? Ah, actually, there is this evening, um, Open Table have a quiz. So if you want to go along to the quiz, that's, again, the Zoom link, um, 6.30. And I think that's mostly everything. Um, oh, and if you're wondering about Miranda today, she is celebrating Zoe's birthday. So keep Zoe in your prayers and, and that's where they are today. Louis, do you um, want to say something else? Well, I was just going to say that there might be a slight delay with coffee uh, while Laura yeah. and I work out just how we're going to do it. But um, there will either be coffee at the usual link um, <laughs> or we will... Um, Laura, will, Laura will put another link on Facebook so uh, keep an eye on Facebook if nothing's happening but hopefully the usual link will work yeah great at this point in the service I was actually going to make a joke but it's not quite late enough I was going to say welcome to those who are just joining us um, who didn't set, set their clocks but actually they would be extremely early 25 minutes early so that joke doesn't really work but I'm just being smug because for once I managed to get up at the right time yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Well, let's, uh, let's then come to the uh, end of our service and I'll say our prayer of blessing. Go in peace. As we walk into Holy Week, we tread the path of Christ. May each stone on the way be firm under your feet. May God remain your rock and may the spirit enfold you in God's care and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. So I will, uh, I'll just let everyone um, give a little wave. You can take yourselves off mute if you'd like to. Lovely to be with you all this morning. Thanks, Thanks for joining us and hopefully we'll see you shortly in our after coffee, but bear with us. All right, bye-bye. Thanks, bye. 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 bye.